Are we on? Good morning and welcome to worship at Christ Church Uniting. It's such a pleasure to be gathered with you in this time. We're gathering in different formats together, some a few here in person in our sanctuary, many joining us online, and, and our heart is together no matter where we are coming into this time and space, and I think the Spirit gives us that gift. Um, so I'm, I welcome you here, and I welcome you into this space, um, especially because it, is a, it is, continues to be such a difficult time out there in the world, and I know it was a difficult week for many of you. And I, instead of a poem this morning, I just want to share a, a brief snapshot of something that happened in our week. Uh, my cousin is here helping us uh, watch the kids while we do some transitional things and we decided we'd like to take a hike and show her a little bit of Hawaii last week and we tried to hike Diamond Head and it was full and we thought we'd do the next best thing which is to climb Cocoa Head. We had, we, we've done it many times before but never with a four-year-old in tow and a baby in a backpack. But I am glad to say we made it about three quarters of the way to the top and my cousin really helpfully said, you know, it's probably going to be just as difficult for us to get back down. And I thought, oh my goodness, you're right, right at that top plate where it just gets steeper and steeper and steeper. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is just a metaphor for what it feels like to be the citizen of the world right now, right? Seems to be getting more and more difficult and the terrain seems to get more steep and there's COVID and it's everywhere and there's Haiti and Afghanistan. And our hearts are with the refugees there and the service people's families who are lost. It just seems like there's no direction we can go that isn't filled with uncertainty and difficulty. And it occurred to me that the same thing we do on the mountain is the thing we do in life, which is just take a time out, breathe in and out check in on the people that are around us, offer to help our neighbors and give them some encouragement such as we are able, and that's what we're doing here, right? We are on a hard road together, but this is a time to take a deep breath, to get a little bit of peace, to be refreshed and refilled, to offer encouragement to our neighbors. So that's the spirit I'm inviting you into this time of worship. And I want to light this candle just as a symbol of that, and a symbol of God's profound and never-ending promise that as often as we come together in that spirit, believing that the spirit will be in our midst, the spirit will in fact be in our midst. So let's drink that in this morning and let's start our muse uh, worship as we always do with song. I'm going to invite Marion and Diane up here to kick us off with Open My Eyes That I May See. So welcome to worship.
having an internet problem, what is our recommendation? Do we just and uh, everyone for their patience. We hope those of you joining online are able to be back on just in time for this cakey moment. I know you didn't want to miss it. So I see you back there, Zelda. Can you see me? Can you see what this is? So I want to tell you a story, but shh, do not tell anybody else in here, okay? Um, I just had a kind of a big birthday. I wasn't here in Hawaii, so we didn't celebrate together, but it was making me think of some other milestone birthdays that I've had in my life, and it was making me think about the day that I turned 16 years old. And on the day that I turned 16 years old, do you know what I did? I went and got my driver's license. And I thought, I am amazing. This is a new level of freedom. And I went over to my friend Christine's house, and I said, come on, we're going to go for a drive. And while I was backing out of the driveway, I ran into her mailbox. And I knocked the mailbox off the post and knocked the post out of the ground. I was a little bit overconfident in this backing out process. And so what we decided to do, we got out of the car, and we set the mailbox back on the post, and we just leaned it up against the mailbox next to it. And we just hoped nobody would notice. Have you ever done something like that? Kind of thought, well, so that happened. And then we came home later that night, and her dad was standing out front of the house and said, hey, what happened to my mailbox? And we said, we don't know. which probably really wasn't the right thing to say, right? We should have kind of owned up to it. Then after a while, he said, really? And we said, okay, we do know. We ran into your mailbox. Um, we're sorry about that. What can we do? And he said, it's okay. I know you're just learning, and I forgive you. And I like to return to that story because it reminds me what it feels like to experience some, a big word we use in the church a lot called grace. Have you ever heard that word in the church? Grace. God shows us grace sort of favor or kindness that's not necessarily deserved. And I think I like to return to that story whenever somebody messes up something of mine and I feel a little bit angry or sad about it, right? And I think I should give that person a piece of my mind. And then I think once I actually totally destroyed somebody's mailbox and they said, that's okay, you're still learning. I think that's good. When we have those experiences, we want to return to them so we can remember what it feels like to get grace and do what Jesus asked us to do, which is share that with other people. So maybe you have a time in mind you can bring to mind right now. What does it feel like to receive that and then try to embody that as we go out in the world? And Christine's dad, I forgot your name. That was a long time ago. Wherever you are, you have profoundly impacted my life. Um, and I hope you got that mailbox fixed. So that is my message to you kids. I give you a blessing, and I hope that you will experience grace in many places in your life, and I'm glad you're here. And online, too, we are glad that you are tuned in, little ones. You are part of our community. So I'm going to turn it over to Kalua, and then we're going to enjoy the sermon. Thanks, Zelda. <laughs> So we are still having some troubles in the world of the great world of the World Wide Web. And if you are able to see this and having any trouble, the instruction I was given to give you online was to refresh. 
and then to go back to our page and look for the live video. So I think we got kicked off. In order to come back on, you may need to sort of sign out, sign back in, and look for it. But I hope you will find that information as we proceed here. I want to read us our scripture reading this morning, which is actually following exactly on our reading from last week. So last week we're in Genesis 49 with Jacob. This week we're in Genesis 50 with his sons, uh, continuing with his sons. And so these are selections from that chapter to try to sort of give you a good sense of the story. And so I would encourage you to be listening for the word of the Spirit to you in this time, to this church in this time, and to the world. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brother said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave us this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, Forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept and fell down before him, saying, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing even now. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. So Joseph remained in Egypt, he and his father's household. And Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw Ephraim's children in the third generation. The children of Machir, son of Manasseh, were also born on Joseph's knees. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely come to you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So Joseph made the Israelites swear, saying, when God comes to you, you shall carry up my bones from here. And Joseph died being 110 years old, and he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. All right, so we're going to continue our amazing tale from last week. Anybody that was here remember what happened last week? We we're talking about Jacob, who upon his death gave each of his sons a blessing before he died, which was actually a summary of all their character flaws. And this week, we just flip over to the next chapter of Genesis to talk about Joseph's death, right? This is a real pick-me-up part of Genesis here. But it's actually a great story. I love this. I can't wait to tell it to you because it's so human. So how many of you remember, either from reading the Bible or going to Sunday school or watching Joseph in the Technicolor Dreamcoat, the story about Joseph? Okay, good. That was a favorite, right? So Joseph was the favorite son of Jacob. He, because he was the son born to Jacob's favorite wife. And he gave dad, Jacob, gave Joseph all kinds of gifts and accolades and always said, this is my favorite, my beloved son, the son of my favorite wife, which like, didn't go too far with helping Jake, Joseph's relationships with all his brothers, right? In fact, it like, made them really jealous. And Joseph himself didn't really help matters because he was constantly reporting that he had had dreams which told him that his brothers would eventually bow down to him as servants. Like, not the best way to sort of ameliorate sibling relationships, right? Not only to be the favorite, but then say, also I had some dreams in which God told me that you would bow down to me as slaves. And so the brothers said, what are we going to do? And they said, we think we should approach a competent therapist to get some coping mechanisms for this. No, they did not. They decided, we'll just kill Joseph and make it look like an accident. But they had some disagreements among themselves. They obviously didn't have sort of good collaborative skills. And so they didn't know exactly how were they going to do it and what were they going to do it and was it really just and maybe we shouldn't really do it. And so instead they just sold him into slavery and they brought back his colored jacket covered in sheep's blood to their father as proof that he had died, which they thought would like settle the matter. And of course it didn't because of Joseph just went down to Egypt and rose to prominence there, interpreting more dreams that really made people angry. And eventually he became an advisor to the king. 
And when his brothers were forced to go down to Egypt in search of food during a famine, Joseph encountered them and forgave them. And they all cried on each other's shoulders. And then they brought good old dad Jacob down to Egypt and they built him an ADU on the side of Joseph's little palace. And they all had fun, right? But then, as we heard last week, Jacob died. And his brothers, in the wake of that, started to get very nervous, right? This is the, thought, the train of thought they started to have. What if Jacob never actually forgave us for all that stuff we did to him back in the day, right? What if he is still really angry that we threw him in a pit to kill him and then took him out instead and then had arguing about him and sold him into slavery? What if he's still mad about that? And he was waiting for our father to die before visiting his revenge on us. Which I have to say seems like a very natural human response. Like I wonder if any of you have ever had the experience of starting to tell yourself a story in your mind about what's happening in somebody else's mind. Do you ever do this? About three of you do this. Man, now I'm feeling all out here and alone, right? Like you call somebody and they don't call me back and you think, okay, they're busy. And then another few days go by and you're like, maybe they're mad at me. Maybe they don't like me anymore, right? And the story can get bigger and bigger and bigger until the person calls back and says, oh, I can't believe it. My phone was broken for three days. And you think, whew. But I think we all do this, right? That's a small example, but I think we all do this. It turns out that our fears are very good storytellers. Like they only need the tiniest little bit of thread to start spinning a yarn, which can really entangle us in a lot of toxicity. And that's what Joseph's brothers do, right? They think he's got an ulterior motive, like he's mad. He says he's not, but we know he is, but he says he's not, but we know he might be, and so we've got to act. And then they go even further. Now, this is an interesting little bit here, right? They cook up a plan to circumvent Joseph's imaginary anger. And I could just see them, right, like sitting around hashing this out, like, what should we do? I don't know, you know, and they, they decide, I know, we will tell him that dad said for him to forgive us on his deathbed. Well, it's kind of genius because how is he going to check? Um, we'll say dad said right before he died, right after the part where he told us about our character flaws, that you should forgive us and not visit revenge against us. And everybody's like, yeah, high five, you know, and they go to Joseph and they sort of start living out this plan. And I just love Joseph's response, right? Joseph says, who am I, God? You know, he says, look, my forgiveness for you is real. And more than that, it actually doesn't matter because what you intended for me as harm, God was able to be at work for good in that. So don't worry, I'll take care of you. It's like, I think that's such a beautiful moment between these brothers that are kind of constantly at war. And then, you know, Joseph lives a lot longer and has some grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and he gives them a little bit of additional hope right before he dies, which is God's going to come for you. God's going to come get us and bring us home. I know it. I've experienced that God is going to be with us, so remember this. And also, if you could take my mummified body with you whenever you go back to Canaan, I would really appreciate it. So right in this like long, drawn-out family feud that's been going on of dozens of chapters of Genesis, it really ends with Joseph saying, I forgive you, I love you, God is going to be with you. And I find it so interesting because I think that really foreshadows the ministry of Jesus in many ways, who seems to say these same things over and over again, and then at the end of his story, right, I forgive you, I love you, God is going to be with you. So I know you know that we've been talking about leave-taking these past weeks, right? Both my leave-taking from this congregation, but also the other necessary departures in our lives that require our spiritual attention, right? Departures from closely held ideas, departures from certain relationships that no longer serve us, departures, some departures from some vision of our future, which for whatever reason can no longer come to pass, right? And it occurred to me, thinking about this and Joseph's engagement with his brothers, that forgiveness plays a role in so much of the work and leave-taking, right? Like, often we must forgive or be forgiven, really in order to move forward. Otherwise, we're just perpetually stuck in the past, like weaving tales in our mind about what might be or what should have been or what we would like to have had happened, right? Or, or what, what could have been. 
And I think that fixation is really powerful. I think it can trap us in a dangerous cycle in which the stories we are telling ourselves loom larger than the story that's actually unfolding in front of us in our life. And we start to concoct, just like Joseph's brother did, little untruths to reconcile the story we're telling in our mind with the stories of our lives. And I think that can be pretty destructive. Or maybe, you know, the story we tell ourselves is about our own unworthiness to be forgiven. Sometimes I think that's just as powerful. It doesn't stop until someone reminds us that the people around us withholding their pardon are not God. That, in fact, God is God and that God's word to us is a word of mercy. We don't tend to overemphasize this in the life of this particular church, but that does sit at the very core of the message of the gospel, right? For the good news, if it is anything, is a robust testimony about the liberating power of forgiveness, right? a discipline that God him, God's self also practices, right? Offering us forgiveness and freedom through the life and death of Jesus and inviting us into that in powerful ways. In fact, sometimes I think reading all the gospel narratives and know what I know and my own experiences would lead me to think that the only way sometimes for God to be at work, to turn what has harmed us into what can bless us, is through the process of forgiveness. So I really want to be encouraging you today to be thinking of the things in your life that you're moving away from. I think we all have those things, right? We're like the tide. We're moving away from certain things toward things. What are you moving away from? Or what things are moving away from you? And I want you to just imagine how you might infuse a spirit of mercy and forgiveness into those transitions. Maybe it's time for you to forgive someone for not being what you needed them to be. Maybe it's time to forgive some institution for not living up to your expectations or for taking something important away from you. Maybe you need to forgive yourself for some misstep or some misunderstanding or for the story that you told to make sense of that misstep or misunderstanding. Now for those who practice and sort of worship together here in this little conversation, I definitely think that part of our journey these next few weeks is about you forgiving me, right? I think that's part of the pastoral transition, right? We're going to spend a lot of time in the next few weeks talking about all the gifts we've shared and celebratory moments. But I hope there's also space for some forgiveness, right? For you to forgive the times I wasn't all that you needed or didn't show up for you in quite the right way or didn't have the words to meet your needs in that time, to forgive the times that we disagreed and could never come to reconciliation. I think in order to move into a new chapter of ministry in this church, You'll definitely have to forgive me for leaving. I think that's real. I think that's part of the work that we do together. But again, I want to draw your attention back to the fact that in our tradition, in the Christian faith, this is the first step to freedom. It is the way to secure God's blessing even in very difficult circumstances. Now, I'm not meaning to say it's easy. and I'm not meaning to say it's quick. But I think it represents God's greatest provision for us, that we can be forgiven and forgive, that we can receive grace and then show it to others. In fact, the act of forgiveness is proof of God's enduring presence with us through it all. And so I just want to encourage you to be thinking about that on your own journey, to be checking in on stories you're telling yourself that are happening in other people's minds. That's just good advice for life but also to ground yourself deeply in the days ahead in the God who has shown you grace again and again and who in fact embodied that grace for you in the person of Jesus in whose names I offer these words. So those are for you to think a little bit on and uh, hopefully the God who created, redeemed, and sustained us will help plant them as a seed within you. So thank you for that and let's continue in a time of music. I'll welcome Diane.
We thank you for that, Diane. Beautiful. We come now to a time of prayer where we do indeed bring our needs for provision and healing to God. We name them in the context of this community. We gather them together that we might be in prayer for each other. I'm going to name just a few that I know. If there are folks joining us online, they are encouraged to type their prayer requests in the comments there, and we will be able to, to pray for those together um, throughout the week. Of course, our hearts are with the Nichols family um, after the loss of Wanda this week. Wanda, longtime member of CCU, and we celebrate her 95 great years of life, and our prayers are certainly with Courtney, Carol, and Greg as they mourn her passing. So we think about Wanda and her great legacy of this church of music and drama. Um, I know many of you have been in touch with me with deep, deep concern in your hearts for the situation in Afghanistan, both for the refugees there desperate to find safety and also for the families of the 13 service people um, who were killed there just this last week. Um, I, I feel that pain too and ask not only that God's healing presence might be in that place, but also that we might be equipped to be an, an aid such as we are able. I know there are also folks sitting here today and joining us online who have very much in their hearts the, the community of the Gulf Coast. So a hurricane arriving there here on the uh, eve of the anniversary of um, uh, Hurricane Katrina. And so we just pray for protection for that place and that we all might come around those in need. Paul Herring offers prayers or asks prayers for the church council as they continue to guide this community through this time of transition. And also thank you, Paul, offering prayers for our family as we are also in a time of great transition. Um, speaking of transitions, I wanted to note I had a wonderful opportunity this week. Um, on Friday, I zipped over to the Honolulu airport and saw there Brian McCraner, um, long time, also member of this church now, a Navy chaplain. He is being deployed to a Navy ship. He was uh, meeting it there in Guam. And so just ask that we might be in prayer for him for protection and provision. They don't know where they will end up, but imagine that circumstances in recent days may impact their mission. And also we might be in prayer for Laura and their family um, as they uh, retreat to the Midwest to be closer to family while Brian's away. So I name all those things, and I know there are more, more prayers here that I hope you will share now and after. But right now I would just invite us to be in a spirit of prayer or meditation as we lift our needs to God. God, we feel that we are living in desperate times. And we acknowledge that we are certainly living in a world that is desperate for you and for a sense of your peace. A world where powers struggle for dominance and war and oppression are seen everywhere. We live in a world where groups of people oppose one another because of ideology, religion, identity, or culture. And we recognize that in this moment, God, we need a God who is bigger than ourselves and our personal interests to guide us in the path of peace. God, we live in a desperate world, and we live in a world desperate for your spirit of wholeness. We know there are many people around this world who are disregarded or devalued, because of poverty or geography or disease. We know there are places where compassion and justice is withheld to some because of their sexuality, their race, or their gender. And so we lay our needs and concerns before you, understanding that we need a Savior who is more compassionate than we are and who includes those that even we might exclude. And so we lay our prayers at your feet. God, we recognize that we live in a desperate world, in a planet that is often mismanaged and abused, a world and its creatures and poor health. We live in a world that sometimes seems that motivation is scarce and creativity in short supply. And so we need a spirit who is more powerful and more creative than we could ever be to assist us in the work of caretaking this world and all its citizens. But God, we know that you are God the creator, and we know that Jesus is Jesus, our loving Savior, and we know that the Spirit present with us is the empowering Spirit. And so as often as we come together, we proclaim the good news that you are with us and that you are more compassionate and more peaceful and more powerful and more creative even than we can imagine. And we give you our prayers because we know that we need your presence with us. So God, we ask that you would captivate us 
that you would call us, that you would equip us, that you would fill us, that we might be carriers of your wholeness and of your internal life to all those for whom we care and to this whole world that we love so dearly. God, we feel we got a glimpse of how we might do that in the life of the Jesus who was your presence with us. We seal our prayers in his name because of that example, and we use these words that he gave to us as a gift, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Sometimes in a desperate world we stop. And we take a breath. We look around us. We try to provide for and share with those gathered with us, and that's what we do here. Take time out to enjoy these gifts, to share them with our neighbors. Here at Christ Church Uniting, this is an open table, so all who are joining, all who feel called to participate in this particular way that God's grace is manifest to us, we encourage you to do that. We believe that God is a gracious host and that all are welcome here. Maybe you're joining at home and you just have a morsel and something to drink. Maybe you're here and you still have one of these silly little cups that we have been forced to use by these strange times. But I think in all of those things, God can be uniquely present to us, in part because we share this meal together as a community. So as we think about coming around this table, I would remind you that it was a desperate world in which Jesus lived too. It was actually the night that he was arrested that he got together around this table or one very much like it with his friends. Surely they had their own personal concerns and the weight of their people upon them as they did, but they shared stories of God's liberation. They shared stories of God's freedom, of God breaking their bonds. And it was in the course of that meal that Jesus did something unexpected. He took a loaf of bread. Having given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to them. He said, this is my body. I'm giving it to you. He said, do this in order to remember me. It was in the same way after supper, we believe, that he took a cup. Having given thanks, he poured it out. He said, this cup represents a new way of relating to God that's made possible by my life and death. And so in this, remember me and know that you will have forgiveness. And so we do that just as Jesus instructed. We come together, we take these simple morsels, and we ask that the Spirit might be in them, that they might become for us truly the bread of life and the cup of blessing, which we share together now. May the Spirit bless what has been received here and bless us to be strong servants of God's love in this world. And to that I say amen. Friends, we're coming to the end of our time together when we think about going back out into the world. And we invite you as often as we come together to be thinking about what is God's specific call to you in this time around how you are going to respond to the good news. Maybe that's acts of service. Maybe that's acts of caretaking, calling a friend. Um, maybe it's somebody else in your church making a connection. I don't forgive that, Pastor Liz. Actually, let's chat about it. Maybe it is um, the gifts of your financial resources to the ministry of this church. Whatever that is, I invite you to just be reflecting on what that is right now as we hear the doxology together. Thank you. You can be seated. 
Friends, I want to just share before we close some notes from the life of the congregation and also a prayer request I forgot, even though it was right here, that Marian asked for prayers for Noel Osherhoff having heart surgery tomorrow. So we, you're right there. So we ask for her well-being, and we'll include that in our prayers this week. A couple of church life updates. One is that Foodland's Give Aloha starts on Wednesday, September 1st. How many of you are familiar with Give Aloha? You go Give Aloha. You go to Foodland. You purchase some wonderful things. When you check out, you say, I'd like to make a contribution through Give Aloha, and they'll say, to what? And you'll say, Christ Church Uniting Disciples and Presbyterians. And they'll say, United Church of Christ. And you'll say, no, Christ Church Uniting Disciples and Presbyterians. And it will go back and forth, and you will remember that I... I was the one who said we should change the name of the church. And um, <laughs> just saying hard truths to one another here at the very end. But we <laughs> I will forgive you. <laughs> we um, That is really helpful, right? You give to Foodland. It seems a little cumbersome, but you give to Foodland. They give that money back to us along with an additional contribution from their foundation. So if you're able to do that, we appreciate that. We'll send out our number in the email. Um, right after this, you are, who are here um, are invited to make your way to the parking lot, not right here, to the parking lot where there is maximum ventilation to share some fellowship. I think some of you brought some food. Even if you didn't, it's okay. Go stand six feet away from some other people and smile at them, and we will we'll try to have some connection that way. Just want to note these beautiful flowers from Paul Brennan um, dedicated to those in search of a new home that they may have hope. So I hope you have an opportunity to just come up here and, and reflect with those a little bit. Um, Rachel Jacobson has opened a virtual CCU fellowship suggestion box. What are things you want to do together and that she can help with so you can be in touch with her if you have ideas. She's also putting together the first ever CCU virtual gratitude journal. I'm really excited about this. And I know a few of you have contributed so far, but this is where, you know, sort of all of the other slideshows we've done, what did you create during the pandemic? This is things you're grateful for to keep our mind really focused on gratitude. So I hope that you will email her. If you are here or if you'd like to stop by during the week, we do still have some things to give to you, three-layer medical masks and some disaster books for homeowners. We hope that you will take advantage of those. Um, also, on September 12th will be my last Sunday here. Um, in case you didn't get the memo, boo. <laughs> but we will be having some, some time during worship to reflect on that and sort of exchange some words of thanks. But we will also have a time after church, thinking from 12 to 2 p.m., that people not able to be here physically or who would choose not to be here physically with us in the sanctuary can kind of drive by, and all some combination of myself and my family will be outside. You can drive by and say aloha in some way that sounds uh, safe for you. So we'll have both those opportunities if you are interested in that. We will also be having, um, because of a strange requirement of Presbyterian bureaucracy, a brief congregational meeting on the afternoon of September 11th to dissolve my pastoral relationship with you. We need 25 people to log on to Zoom for five minutes. Do you think we can accomplish that great pandemic feat? 25 people on Zoom for five minutes. I think we should make it happen, and we'll send out that link too. Are there other things that I'm missing for the good of the order? John. Yes. So this is the Faith Action Unit Investment Drive. So just a quick update. Faith Action, the community organizing body of which we're a part. We get together with a bunch of other people, right? More people, more power. We advocate for affordable housing, elder care, uh, the environment, things like that. If you are, so we, we give money from our church mission budget to that, but we also have one time a year when we invite you to make individual contributions to that. That's happening now. You can find the link in our email, but if you have any trouble, you can also email our office, can send it to you. So that is happening now. Faith Action needs your help to do its great work, which has continued. Our need for affordable housing, elder care, and environmental justice has not ended since the pandemic, so they could really use your support. Anything else that we are, yes. Hi. <laughs> I'm going to look into that. I haven't read the Book of Order quite, <laughs> quite closely enough, but yes, possibly. That would really, yes, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. So those are the things that are happening. Of course, we will send these out along with our prayers this week, but right now I'm going to suggest that we close. And thankfully, we have one last musical installation. We've tried to pick some 
heavy hitting favorites in this season so that we can draw our hearts together through song. So Diana Marion, would you please come forward? I hope this has been a helpful respite for you on the side of the trail, whether you are going up or whether you are going down. I hope this has been a time of peace to restore your heart. 
And as you go forth, remember that you have been shown grace and that the world needs you to show grace. So that is my encouragement for you. And I also want to share these words of blessing. Life is short, and we do not have long to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And may the divine mystery, which surpasses all our understanding, but who made us and who loves us and who travels with us, may that God bless us and keep us always in peace. Amen. Thanks. And see you.